Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Give Thanks, How to Win Donors Over with Your Gratitude. Here at Mobile Cause, we are dedicated to supporting you, whether it's running your organization, planning for your fundraising campaign, or better engaging with your donors. And today, we're helping you master how to appreciate your donors through segmentation, tailored messages, and creating unique and impactful thank yous that are sure to leave your donors coming back to give to your cause time and time again. As always, we'll be sending a recording of this webinar and the webinar slides to all registrants via email. We want to encourage you to submit your questions through the presentation into the questions box on your control panel. At the end, we'll be having a bit of Q&A with our panelists, so keep those questions coming. Now, we appreciate you joining us today for our live webinar. We'd also love to connect with you on social media, and we'll be live tweeting during the presentation. You can find us on Twitter, at MobileCause, and you can use today's hashtag, GiveThanksWebinar. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's panel of experts. George Weiner is the founder and CEO of Whole Whale, a nonprofit-focused digital agency. Prior to Whole Whale, George was the CTO of DoSomething.org, where he became an innovator in social media, mobile technologies, and social cause. George has worked with over 50 nonprofits to increase cause awareness, multiply meaningful online engagement, and train teams to implement strategic use of data and technology. Julia Campbell is an author, coach, and speaker. She trains nonprofits, large and small, on the best ways to use digital tools to raise money and awareness for their organization. Julia's blog is consistently featured in the top 150 nonprofit blogs in the world, and she is the author of Storytelling in the Digital Age, a guide for nonprofits. Our speakers have put together an information-packed agenda for you today. They'll cover the importance of understanding and segmenting your donors, tailoring your communications, and thanking them in genuine and memorable ways. All of this will help your nonprofit have higher donor retention that will keep your donors coming back to give to your cause time and time again. So let's get started today with a quick poll. I'm going to go ahead and launch this for you through the webinar interface as well. And the question is, are you segmenting your donors enough? So go ahead and select your response from the polling interface there. I'll leave this open for about another 10 or 15 seconds. Excellent. We have just over two-thirds of the audience voting so far. So leave it open for a few more moments. Going once. Going twice. All right, let me go ahead and close that out and I'll share the results with everybody. So, by and large, it looks like the majority of you are in that no category. <laughs> a good segment of you are not sure, and a few of you are segmenting your donors just fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, I'm curious, George, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, uh, I think you have joined the right webinar. You're going to spend a, a few minutes with us today, very graciously learning exactly why this is so critical. But I think I don't need to convince you on that uh, because, uh, because of that importance. Uh, I'm the Chief Whaler of Whole Whale. I'm really excited to, to be speaking with you about this stuff because we are super passionate about uh, basically data and technology at Whole Whale. We love working with uh, across many different causes and clients, and we've learned an incredible amount uh, when it comes to segmentation and the data available because we see so much low-hanging fruit and we see so much opportunity because we believe the sector has been handed the like world's largest lever and fulcrum, and we aren't doing enough. We aren't doing enough with it. And so these tactics are really designed to focus uh, focus your work in on how uh, how data and tech can be used. And so to that end, here's a marketing funnel. Uh, and in the marketing funnel, you know what? You have seen this many different ways in many different shades. In this one, you know, feel free to grab and, grab and copy and make it. You know, we move from aware to interested, engaged, and then finally committed, people giving, and then giving again to your organization. So we're building our audiences, we're optimizing, we're telling good stories, but I think it's important to see the full context here and understand why, uh, why and what we're doing these types of activities and can help hopefully like align our groups. And you know, when we think about our marketing, I love the 80-20 rule. For those of you not familiar, you know, many events, roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes, the Pareto principle. And this follows across everything from, from natural to human behavior and is definitely true of, of our fundraising and of our activities around awareness building. For instance, on this 
uh, on this very webinar, you know, I'm willing to bet that, you know, 10% of us uh, have more than 90% or thereabouts of the social media followers, or even for that point, wealth. <laughs> so when we get into the funnel, we go a bit deeper. We go a bit deeper when we talk about segmentation because it doesn't just end with committed. Somebody gives you a dollar once and then off, off to the next person. No, we care about, first off, how we get those one-time donors, the reoccurring donations, large donations. We gotta segment this. It, uh, it goes further down the pipeline. And this is where I think it's important to match up the 80-20 rule, where we do, in my experience, spend 80%, 80% of our time up there at the top. You know, we're building these stories, we're creating websites, we're creating social media posts, we're sending out messages. But the results, I think you see where this is going, right? The results come from the bottom. It comes from when people are actually clicking the donate button, making the decision to give. And I don't think we spend enough time on that bottom 20%. And a lot of it comes from using our data and understanding that pool of givers, the pool of people who care about us that are committed and treating them the right way. And, uh, uh, and that's where the results come from. So I'm excited to walk through some of what we think, you know, the, the right questions are for this. And in that, when we are looking, we're going to cover in this period of time here, our donors lapsing. What is our donor lifetime value, like customer lifetime value over their relationship with us? Where are donors coming from? How are our marketing channels working together? And then finally, the, the which generation likes us? When we go through these, we're going to see also that I'm going to refer to various tools and ECRMs uh, and, and management databases. I'm assuming that you have got basic ability in your email management system to segment so I can uh, create some sort of filter on people that have taken some sort of action. I have tracking of open rates and deliverability, uh, and I have the ability to do some form of A-B testing. The donor analytics side, uh, we are using a tool called fundraising report card, but frankly, you know, if you have a, you know, a data analyst on staff or you are an Excel ninja, uh, you can use those tools as well to, to do that. So this isn't as much as to say is that th this is hopefully not out of reach for you, though. I think it is a good reminder that, wait a minute, we do need, you know, we do need to be this tall to ride the ride in, um, in some cases. As we move, and further, another big tool that we love to talk about is Google Analytics. You know what? Uh, this is free analytics code for your website. It's a JavaScript. It has to live on every page, and it takes about 30 minutes to install. It shows us the, the what, where, how, when activities on your site, but not so much the why. So this is another big precursor to understanding uh, donor behavior on our site as we move through. Some more advanced configurations that you can get into because Google Analytics out of the box doesn't go that far, but you can set up goals, you can set up events, things like outbound clicks, scroll depth, timers on the site, of course, donations. Uh, we can set up sales funnels, uh, which we'll show a little bit of for, especially if you have a donation process, you wanna see how people are moving through that. Uh, frankly, like any click on that site can be tracked in some way, shape or form. Um, and it, it's important to know the extent of that. Uh, all right, let's jump into some of the questions. Are donors lapsing, right? Are we losing, uh, roughly, are we losing 75 grand in donations? Um, and the average is, you know, we're gonna lose, according to general stats, uh, uh, roughly four out of five new first time donors uh, are not gonna return next year. So that means like 2016, somebody gave to you. There's like an 80% chance they are not going to give to you again, which is crazy. Uh, it's a little bit sad, actually. Um, you know, if that's if that's how Coca-Cola operated, uh, they wouldn't be Coca-Cola. They would be a beverage we never heard of. So it's important to reach out, not just to our high value uh, donors, but also looking at this sort of lapsed report that you can do in fundraising and corporate card, or frankly, like, you know how to filter your own data to find this. So that's a good one. Now, the question is, if somebody gave to you in 2016, are you going to send the same message to them that you would a new potential donor? All right, I'll let that that just sort of float out there. Hopefully the answer is uh, no, don't send the same message. We want to segment. <laughs> What's our donor lifetime value? Lifetime customer value is incredibly important across many different industries. Sometimes I don't know if we think about that though. We think about the, the one and done donation. Oh, somebody gave us, uh, you know, $100 this year. Well, that's good. Good to know, but 
do you actually know that if someone gives you $500, is their lifetime value to you 5x that initial donation over the next three to four years? That type of thing, the donor lifetime value, is incredibly important to know because you can back into things about acquisition strategies and how valuable actually the, the messaging you do is and how valuable the outreach you do is. And, and tracking this and understanding it is, uh, is of course important for segmentation as well. So donor lifetime value, another metric to think about, very important to look at. Another question, next up, where are our donors coming from? Where are our donors coming from with regard to geography? Now I'm looking at Google Analytics and I'm assuming that you have Google Analytics set up on, on your website. And as you go through, if you go into the audience section, if you go into the audience section and then uh, go down to, to location inside of Geo, we can filter down and get into cities and understand our different cities. Uh, and then goal conversion rate. Remember when I talked about setting up goals? So out of the box, unless you set up a, for example, donation as a goal, uh, you won't be able to see this, but once you do, you can get goal conversion rate based on city. Now we get all sorts of interesting information uh, and it depends. So for instance, for this organization, I find it fascinating actually, that as we look through, they have got huge conversion rates for Los Angeles in terms of their, in terms of their donors, but then they like drop off a cliff for Boston. And maybe that's because their accent isn't Boston enough, or maybe they trash the Red Sox. I don't know, but here's a sort of insight that you can take back to your team. You can understand how your content is playing across state lines. Fun stuff to play with. Hopefully I'm giving you like a, oh, wait a minute. I wanna check out my analytics. That's the type of question that I hope leads to some insight. If, uh, as I go through some of these, you do have questions, remember that chat room is uh, open and waiting. All right, so extending where are our donors coming from, we can answer this a different way with regard to goal flow. So flowing through the site, what are they clicking on? How do they get to our general donation page, right? Inside of here under conversions, once we have this, we can see the previous pages that we're bringing them in. Was it Charity Navigator? Uh, was it Bing? Was it Google? They come into the page and then we can also get the drop off for that page and addition to value. So setting up the goals gives us a lot more information on our donor pathways and the different steps they get there. I talked about the funnel and if you have a multi-step donation page, this is critical because you can craft a perfect email, perfect social media post and if you drop somebody onto a poorly formed donation page, people will leave it. As a rule of thumb, Every new page, every new click that you expect someone to progress through, you're gonna lose roughly 90% of that audience. Reduce the steps, reduce the forms to critical information only. Again, every step you add will cost you. Think about the difference of this flow, which is pretty sad. 1,100 people started at the donation first page and 10 remained after because they sent them through a couple extra pages of click to do this or that. So reduce the steps and track your data. Check your doctor, results may vary, but as you move into the end of the year, one little step here could have brought a huge difference. Okay, next, how are our channels working together? This is inside of conversions and assisted conversions because you know what's not happening at the diamond store, people are not walking around asking each other to marry each other, meaning that you have to go on a few dates before you get to marriage, before you're buying a diamond ring, before you're making a donation. People are not just saying, hey, what's this organization? Never heard of this before. You know what? I've got a hundred bucks burning, uh, burning a hole in my pocket right now. Let me get rid of it. That doesn't happen that often. So look, how are our marketing channels working together? Multi-channel marketing uh, in the past has been very difficult. It now is super simple because they use cookies to track looking back uh, somewhat 90 days, and also the cookies on the site that you have visited just recently are gonna expire after uh, about two years. So we can see the overlap between our email work, our organic, our direct, and see how they work together in assisted conversions that eventually led to a last click conversion, i.e. The, the buying of the diamond or the donation moments. So understanding how those channels work together are super helpful. 
as we go, which generation likes us? This is uh, data from Power Poetry, the largest teen poetry platform for young people to share their work. Are we AARP friendly? In these, this case, I just said teen poetry. So we can look at data, and I'm going to visualize it a little bit differently just to give you an idea. Great. So we're looking at goal conversion rate, right? How much are they converting, in this case, to become new poets on the site and share their work? And 18 to 24-year-olds, bingo. Great. Over-indexing, according to the site, 39%. And it's fine that 65 plus is not. However, if your site demographics want to play a bit differently, if you want to be appealing to different markets, this is an interesting thing to check. I'll also note those data are available on Facebook for your activities on, uh, on that site. Uh, in general, for that generation which likes us, we recommend upgrading to Universal and turning that on inside of Google Analytics. In which case, you'll be able to get age breakdowns as well as our binary gender measures in Google. Yes, you can go fight them for extra categories. Solutions. All right. Don't offer problems only. Solutions. Uh, track, build, A-B test, repeat your message, and numbers are people too. I'm going to walk through these as best I can. Okay. Look. Look, track, learn, and act. Um, look, less always gets more. I was talking about the, the number of fields. So fewer pages, fewer fields, more dollars. I mentioned that before. That's a key takeaway uh, and a rule of thumb to follow. <laughs> we try to simplify that one, uh, especially when we're talking about donation pages. Solution two, some ideas here. You can build rich segments. Um, so we created a rich user segment that you can grab at bit.ly slash Rich GA, use the exact caps and whatnot. We can also post that in the chat, but uh, we can build remarketing segments of our traffic of the 20 richest cities in America, uh, which we pulled together and filtered out uh, inside of your own analytics. Solution three, A-B testing subject lines. Thinking about what drives actual traffic to your site, emails, right? Was moving to email time. Sender, subject line, and preheader can all be tested and should. Think about the sender and how that plays out because when we look through, we are seeing, you know, for example, with Hillary Clinton, uh, she changed uh, the different messages in here and then seeing how in case of, uh, you know, Diane Furstenberg, who is like a fashion designer, they like, they'll send it from them, send it from your founder, send it from uh, interesting folks. Don't just get caught in the subject line. Uh, these things do uh, these things do matter though. So quick test here, just in your mind. Here's a two subject lines we sent out to the 100k list, and uh, the result had uh, a difference of about you know 9300. So which would you say is going to do better? Here's our we're sitting in the content room. Typhoon, high end, sports slam, or what would you change? And in this case, the results are pretty overwhelmingly in favor of the what would you change subject line? A bit more abstract, you know we're giving you partial information, but that's a huge difference. And you're gonna realize when you do these tests, uh, the open rate uh, will sway quite a bit sometimes when you are optimizing for your subject lines. Next takeaway here, we want you to consider, uh, we interviewed the uh, Environmental Defense Fund about their email strategies in episode 71 of our podcast. Fascinating stuff here, the takeaway here was that they actually had hard ass emails. They tested, right? They did a group of, they sent, here's like, a, you know, let's say 100,000 people. They sent one group four messages and one group five messages in December. So 100,000 group, 100,000 group, right? And they sent one four, one five. And the higher contacted group, the one with five emails gave 8% more. Now you're like, oh my gosh, they're tiring them out. They're boring them. Like, you know what? When it comes to giving season, this is what they are doing. You know, talk to your doctor. Results may vary, but... Look, I think it is critical to understand the volume that, that these big players are doing. You can use your opt-out and unsubscribe as a barometer, you know, if this is hurting your list. Uh, but that's a, it's an interesting one, that, uh, especially as we get to the end of the year to consider. Okay, numbers are people too. How we speak about numbers internally matters. For instance, you know, with regard to newsletters, we could say the 315 newsletter signups during the month of September, an average of 10 and a half per day, or we can say during September, 315 people signed up to hear more from us. This should lead to 31 new donors in the next six months. It can unify your team a lot more, make the case for, for numbers, for data, for your marketing, your email marketing, uh, a lot better if you tie it to the humans, the, you know, the good old uh, uh, meat behind the numbers. Finally, it's a good reminder here that people are people too, which is just a funny way to say that the gather, ask questions, analyze insights, and act process. This process I have been uh, 
<laughs> rapidly moving you through this process, gathering the information from either, you know, a fundraising report card, your CRM, your email CRM, your analytics, it's all there. The data should be there if you set it up. Only works if you ask questions, ask the right questions, ask your team what they need to know to do their jobs better, dive in, analyze, grab those insights, and then learn and act. Remember, we were produced the solutions. We didn't just data puke all over you saying, hey, here are the numbers, good luck with that. We're trying to find actions that we can take uh, such that we can we can increase it. And, and it's dependent on people. It's dependent, something tells me, on the you know 400 plus attendees that we have, we have here, taking the time to, to learn more about what's possible uh, with your data and tech, especially uh, with regard to the causes that you're working on. So, you know, with that, I'll, I'm going to donate my uh, my extra couple minutes back to the back to the team here to make sure we've got time for the other presenters uh, and questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, George. And thanks for helping us take a look at donor segmentation. Uh, next up, we're going to be hearing from Julia. All yours. Take it away. Great. Thank you so much. Um, wow, that was amazing. I just have to say that I am a huge data nerd. I wish I understood more about it. And what I'm going to talk about is a little bit on the surface sexier because it's going to be the tools and Facebook and video and all of that. But if you're using all these tools that I'm going to talk about and you're not doing what George talked about, I mean, that is, it, it, it's all going to be kind of for naught. So I loved, loved, loved that presentation. Okay. So thank you so much. So I'm going to go through some simple ways to thank and recognize your donors uh, using digital tools and social media because, you know, despite what you might think, your donors most likely are using at least one social network. You know, don't think because they're older that they're not. And also don't think because they're younger that they're not. There's a social network out there for everybody. And that's why the donor segmentation and knowing your donors and knowing your demographics and knowing who you're trying to reach, getting that data and using it is so important. So a few startling statistics, not to totally scare you, but the struggle for donor retention is real. Donor attrition is pretty horrific and we talked about that a little bit in the previous presentation, but it, it's unbelievable to me that organizations want to think about creating social media campaigns and doing Giving Tuesday campaigns and reaching all these new donors, acquiring these new donors when they are just shedding donors at such an alarming rate. And just think about if you lost 90% of your Facebook fans year after year and you had to regain those somehow you would notice that more than you would notice your donors so it's just crazy to me i'm not sure why we don't have these dedicated donor retention plans and marketing automation and, and data um, analysis around donor retention so it's pretty crazy we all know this that's why we're on this webinar we want to think about ways that we can thank donors keep them in the fold keep them loving us so in my experience, there are really three main things that all donors need. Some donors might need less, some donors might need more, but there are three main things, uh, three common threads that kind of cut across all donors, no matter the age, no matter uh, the cause. They have to receive a timely, meaningful acknowledgement. That means more than just a receipt. That means more than just an email receipt or a tax receipt. They have to trust you that you're a good steward of their funds and they have to understand the impact of their gift and know that even if they gave $10, that it was a meaningful gift and that it helped accomplish something. So how can we do that in our communications with donors, especially using social media and digital tools? The number one type of content across social networks, I get this question all the time, is video. We cannot get away from it, it's love it or hate it, video is what it is. It cuts across all channels, it cuts through the clutter. Now it auto plays on Instagram, whether you love that or hate that, I just noticed that the other day when I updated my iPhone, that now all my Instagram videos auto play. Th that catches your attention though. So it doesn't have to be an epic masterpiece. You can use your smartphone. 
for me, I, I always tell my clients the key is that authenticity and that genuine connection and being able to tell a really, really great story. So I think that you can use it to launch your fundraising campaign, especially if you're doing Giving Tuesday, you're doing year-end fundraising. It can also be a great way to wrap one up. So a good example that I found of um, a video, um, some video tools are Instagram and Snapchat, okay? So you don't have to have an Instagram or a Snapchat account officially for your nonprofit. You can use them just like little video and photo editing tools. And I know a lot of organizations do that. They have a quote Snapchat account. It's totally private. No one sees it. They don't really broadcast to it, but they record video within Snapchat and then they can add enhancements, they can do text overlay, they can do quick edits, stickers, filters, you can save it to your phone and use it like a file, like you would a media file. Flyer, Animaker, After Effects, these are all tools that I've used and are very simple, low cost. Animoto is probably my favorite. So don't think that just because you're a small organization that you can't use video, especially in your online fundraising or your marketing campaigns. You absolutely can do it. I'm on a crusade to tell people that even in the smallest organizations, you have a mobile video studio. You have a studio in your smartphone. So another great way, Facebook ads. So Facebook ads can actually be used incredibly strategically. Um, you, I'm not sure if anyone on this webinar has done this, but you can upload your email list. Once again, this is assuming that you have that like eCRM, um, assuming that you have a way to know who is a donor and who is not a donor on your email list. You can upload your email list to Facebook Ads Manager, create ads targeted to this audience. So you can actually target an ad to people that gave to you this year and say thank you for giving. You can target an ad to people who gave to you on Giving Tuesday last year and say thank you for giving on Giving Tuesday, please give again. Or just letting them know the results of their gift. And that's kind of what I would do. I think if I was using Facebook ads and spending the money, I would promote impact and promote the accomplishments of the organization and then encourage people to maybe learn more take another step. I'm not 100% sure I would spend a ton of money promoting an ask unless you are an organization that is in the news or works for emergency relief. There are ways to do it, but for smaller organizations, I think that it's just wonderful to be putting your impact directly in front of your donors, especially where they live, which a lot of them do live on Facebook. You have to use colorful and eye-catching imagery. You cannot have a lot of text. It has to be pretty simple, but it's just a great way to once again segment your donors and reach them in another channel and another place that they are. We all know you have to have multiple touch points during your campaigns. Even if they're thank you campaigns, you have to have multiple touch points so people will see it. So you can use it to showcase your results. You can use it to demonstrate your impact, share your data. Um, you can use it to encourage giving again. Just really say, please join us. These are the results we got last year. Share an infographic, share your annual report. Just another way to make sure your message is getting in front of your donors. Share a wonderful story, share a link to your blog post. There are just so many great ways to use Facebook ads. And you know, we can use it in two ways. You can boost a post from your Facebook page without going too much into the technical details, or you can create a standalone Facebook ad campaign, upload that email list and target it just to that specific audience. I think that's a great, great way to use Facebook ads to thank donors. Also creating donor spotlights. Also, this is something else you could promote in a Facebook ad if you created a donor spotlight. And you see how these will all work together? So you can create one piece of content and then create a short video around it, promote it with a Facebook ad. So they're all holistic, they all work together. I'm not suggesting that you need to create 27 different pieces of content a day and post to 45 different platforms a day. That would be way too much. Create something great that highlights a donor, that showcases someone that has had an impact in your organization. Maybe do it once a month. I know some organizations do it more frequently than that, but it just provides you with so much 
data, but it also provides you with so much rich content. You can do it in an interview format. You can do it where you're you're talking to someone and you're interviewing them in a video or via a written piece like this. You can write it journalist style where you're writing it almost like an article, a research article. Make sure you talk about the connection to the cause so you don't just talk about the donor and who they are and what they do in their business and that kind of thing make sure you talk about how they became connected to the cause and also how they became connected to your organization why do they continue to support your organization and why would they encourage other people to give Donors like to hear from donors. We all like to hear from people that are like us. So these are some examples. You'll get the copy of these slides. Um, let's see, go back a little bit. You'll get a copy of these slides. So you'll be able to look at these donor spotlights. I love the simple ones. Just a quote, you know, like George Hampton, growing up, I never doubted love. And this is why I'm giving in honor of my mother. And then on the Smithsonian website, they juxtaposed a story of an intern with a story of a family that made that internship possible. So it's kind of both sides of the coin there, and I thought that was really wonderful to see both sides of that. So take a look at those examples. I'm sure you have others that you've seen in your travels online. And the best part of donor spotlights is no confidentiality restrictions, especially if it's a donor that wants to tell their story. You can get a lot of great visuals. You don't have to worry about identity or changing names or anything about that, anything like that. So I'm encouraging you to thank your donors via spotlighting them, but also thank your donors um, via highlighting one of their own. So. Number four, celebrate giving anniversaries. I went to a conference last year and I heard a talk about marketing automation to thank donors and celebrating giving anniversaries was the number one tip that I took from it. If you have a, the capability of figuring out the day your donors made their gift or the month or even the, a range, you can automatically send them an email anniversary card. You could also do this with Facebook ads. Every month, pull a list. It could be 20 people. Pull a list from your email list of your donors for the month and create a Facebook ad thanking them for their gift. Can you imagine if you saw a Facebook ad that was targeted that directly to you? I think you would pay attention. So it's all about getting that message in front of them in as many ways as possible thanking them via every channel that you have at your disposal. I honestly, I think I would send a happy anniversary and change the terms um, and change it and do it at the six month mark. I don't think I would wait a full year. I definitely would do it at a year, but I might not wait a year to um, say happy anniversary or to thank them for sure. You don't want to wait a year. But I think I would make it a big celebration. I cannot believe the amount of charities that I donate to that I do not get an anniversary card from. I, I, would, I don't think I've ever gotten an anniversary card. It's just kind of shocking to me because it's such a simple thing. I get anniversary cards, you better believe, from DSW and Victoria's Secret and Amazon and everybody, everywhere else I shop online. Why can't charities do it too? It's all that goes back to either the marketing automation or just looking at your list, knowing who your donors are. It's something really simple, especially if you're a smaller organization, you should be able to do that. Um, if you're a bigger organization and you have marketing software automation, then it should be pretty easy to set up. Thank you, you've just changed lives. Charity Water does a really good job of that. I don't know why smaller nonprofits can't do it. They should be doing it. You'd be standing out immediately. So number five, I really like this one. This is not something I see very much. And I think that organizations should do more in terms of virtual events because they're free. Of course, you have to organize them, but you don't have to pay a caterer. You don't have to pay a band. You don't have to pay a room fee. And also it's so much less work. So holding a virtual event, a virtual thank you. What if you just did 24 hours, I don't think I would do a 24 hour virtual event, but 24 hours of thank you are right around Thanksgiving. And then for an hour, you had your executive director, your board members, maybe you had some client stories, you had some donors Skyping in, 
you could use Google Hangouts on air, record it. I personally use Crowdcast a lot. I love Crowdcast. We're using GoToWebinar right now. Whatever it is that you want to use, but you could do um, a part of it in person or a part of it virtual. And it could be q and A. I I think it would need to be of value to the people that you're trying to reach. I can't, I don't think it could just be, you know, a virtual party where you're sort of popping balloons or popping champagne and no one's going to tune in live for that. So have some kind of added value to it. So Google Hangout on women in manufacturing and they're going to have some of the biggest names in women in manufacturing. They're going to address news stories. They're going to talk. They're going to answer questions live. That's the added value. And if it's exclusive to your donors, it can be a really big bonus and a really big thank you. Make sure you focus on that storytelling, you know, showcasing the impact. Take the time to collect some really great stories and really showcase that impact. But use these tools that are available to you. I know that I just have a really hard time going to a lot of these in-person nonprofit events that I want to go to. I have two young kids. I run a business. I also, in winter, really don't like to leave my house. So how can you still get me? But I don't mind being on a webinar. I'll go on Skype. I'll certainly pop on Skype either on my phone or Google Hangouts for a few minutes if I can't do the whole hour, and I'll participate uh, in that way, and then I at least feel included. So just try to think about that. Audiences are shifting. Audiences are changing. We all know that it, it gets a lot tougher to entice our donors to go to a physical location. So just try to think about using some of these free and low-cost tools to, to really connect with your donors and thank them. Some other cute little graphics that I saw. I like this happy hour mixer. I've seen tweet chats that are sort of happy hour tweet chats where everyone, you know, you can have your tea or your coffee or your cocktail, whatever you have, and you come together on a tweet chat and you answer questions. Um, Google Hangout a thon, people talking about why they give. So there's lots of great ideas out there. There's lots of creative ways, I think, that you can host a thank you party for your donors virtually maybe have part of it in person, maybe encourage them to help you plan it, ask them what they want to see. But the whole point is just to give people multiple touch points to connect with you and to humanize your organization and really learn about the people behind your organization um, and what they do. So let me see if I can click. Sorry for the delay. Okay, awesome. throwing it back to you guys. Cool. Thanks so much, Julia, for sharing such insightful knowledge with us. And for our attendees right now, uh, I'm going to launch another quick poll for us. So keep an eye out for this in the in-session interface and select all that apply here. Which methods would you like to implement for this coming year? Well, let's find out. Go ahead and select your options. More than one can be selected here and hit the submit button. I'll leave this open for another 10 or 15 seconds. Excellent. And the more participation we get, the more accurate the results will be. This could be beneficial for everybody to see the result though. So we go ahead and shut it down in just a couple seconds. Going once, going twice, and I'm going to close that poll down and I'll share the results. Cool. Well, everyone's pretty close with three of those options, video, donor spotlight, celebrating it. giving anniversaries. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> cool. All right. Now, we're going to um, switch gears for a few minutes, and we want to answer any questions that folks may have. So let's see here. The first question that we're going to start with actually came in a, a couple of times while George was presenting. So George, if you could speak to what an A-B test actually is and how one might model something like that uh, to actually do an A-B test. Sure. We actually have tons of A-B testing resources on our site. In short, it is a test of whether a message, be it on email or your website or frankly, uh, any type of thing is tested on a smaller sample size audience of the whole, say, let's say you've got an audience of 100,000, you take 10% of that list and send five, then you send half of that uh, message A saying, give now, and 
the second message you would test is give now or else and effectively see which performs better. And maybe it's the give now or else in a tongue in cheek manner that does better by 10%. Uh, you send that to the full list and suddenly uh, you just test it for free how people are going to respond a bit better uh, and, and get the upside of that. Awesome. And we're uh, sending some links out through the questions panel right now that you're welcome to open up with more info about A-B testing. So feel free to bookmark those for reading after the webinar. Excellent. Now our next question here is for Julia. So I launched a successful campaign in 2012. I want to launch a new one in 2018, but I haven't been in touch with most of them since. So wouldn't it be weird to go back and ask them again without having kept in touch? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I completely, I think that it would be, but I don't think that all is lost. So I think you could make it kind of tongue in cheek and maybe, you know, almost like a belated birthday card, send them something that said kind of like, oops, sorry, we, we haven't been in touch this year, but we really want to share the great stuff we've been doing. Make sure there's at least one touch point between asking because first of all a lot of them if you, especially if they're on your email list and they haven't heard from you all year now they're going to get an email from you and you might get a lot of unsubscribes and that's completely fine because you know that's what happens when you first start talking to someone again after a while but i wouldn't i wouldn't let that um deter you i said i i think you could do a great video that just says hey we've been so busy this year creating this great impact um but we want to take the last couple weeks of November to do a gratitude campaign and thank you, do a video, post it on social media, really quick video with your smartphone, get on the phone with these people, really thanking them, asking them um, what they'd like to see in terms of communication. But uh, I wouldn't just, you know, sort of throw up your hands and say, oh, we haven't talked to them so we can't ask them again create just start creating that relationship again really just i think if you're very genuine especially if you're a small organization i'm sure you are and you're stretched very thin and you don't have a lot of staff then people will appreciate it and you know they'll 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 respond to you just being honest about you know maybe what got in the way of you communicating with them well thank you sure Next question here is for George. So we're just getting started with segmenting our donors. Where would you suggest that we start? Yeah, well, fantastic to hear that. You know, I would uh, start with the uh, basically the one time donors versus everyone else and also a separate high net worth or a different tier net worth levels, depending on how big that list is uh, another piece that actually Julia brought up is, you know, you can shove that list into Facebook and not only be able to target them, but it'll also give you some demographics uh, on that list and maybe give you some other insights as to uh, ways to engage them. But yeah, by uh, behavior, segmentation by behavior is the smartest thing to go by uh, and that. Excellent. Thank you. All right, so let's see, looking for more questions here. Feel free to keep entering those in the questions box. Uh, let's One more piece on oh, segmenting. Yeah. Uh, you can also uh, choose to send, and this is something the Environmental Defense Fund does, send based on open rate behavior. Now you can do this based, you know, look at your donor list or your overall list. You can send more emails to the people that continually open your, your emails actually. But also, you can resend older messages to people that didn't open your email and sort of recycle that uh, as well. Yeah, good idea. Thank you. And we, we just sent out some resources in the chat for how to kind of target with your emails and use that A-B testing uh, concept. Cool. So last question today, uh, both for both of you, both George and Julia, uh, what strategy can I use to motivate my donors to be more active to our activities and email? So we'll start with your response there, Julia. Active through activities and email. Well, first of all, you have to have interesting activities and interesting emails. I mean, that's really where it starts. And if you don't share interesting information in your email, then people are not 
going to open it. So think, I would, I would flip it on its head. It's less about what you want to tell your donors and it's about what they want to hear. And that's very hard for organizations to do. But if you, if you, understand who your donor is, what they're passionate about, what moves them, what interests them, especially what draws them to your organization, then you can start creating very brief, short, to the point emails. I totally agree with George's point that he made via data. Sending more emails does not equate to donor fatigue at all. I would prefer more emails with shorter to the point great information than a longer quarterly newsletter that is full of graphics and, and it takes like you know 20 minutes to read so I think shorter emails more frequently focus on stories and focus on the subject lines please don't send me an email that says November newsletter just don't do it that's that's probably my best tip <laughs> excellent and and George anything to add there what are your thoughts on uh, ways to couple motivate stats. donors. A couple stats, yeah, a couple stats for you. One is that a volunteer is 10 times more likely to give to your organization than someone who's not volunteered. Now I'm going to use the word volunteer in a more holistic way. Not only have they maybe planted a tree, but they've invested some amount of time to move your cause forward. If you can get creative with that some amount of time, even if it is a, a collectivism type of element, uh, it will pre-warm your audience. The next piece is that the number one reason that millennials give is because their friends ask them. How are you designing messages that can be shared? How are you crafting asks to the more committed people on your lists to ask their friends? And there are tools out there that can do this, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising elements, uh, and even uh, things that you can build on your site saying, hey, we want you to be the bearer of this news. We want you to be the messenger because you believe in this. So uh, it's not just what you can send to the many, is what your dedicated few can then message out. Love that. Awesome. Thank you so much for that insight, indeed. Cool. So uh, before wrapping up today, we wanted to get you some, or get your very valuable feedback on what you'd like to see from us in 2018. So go ahead and just type in the questions box, maybe use that as a comment section now, and type in suggestions for what sort of topics you'd like to see us cover. And uh, we'll be sure to catalog that and reference that as we plan out our agenda for 2018. Excellent, I see lots of input coming in there. Thank you for that. And keep that coming. Uh, now, if you're interested in discovering how to accelerate your fundraising and donor engagement, uh, programs, you can speak directly with an expert at Mobile Cause by calling the phone number you see here at the bottom of the slide, 888-661-8804, or by visiting our website, mobilecause.com forward slash free dash consultation. All right, cool. So once again, I want to thank both of our presenters for their uh, wonderful insights and for taking the time to present today. Uh, Hearts go out to you, thank you again. And I wanna thank all of our attendees as well for showing up. Uh, all of you will receive the webinar recording and a slide presentation shortly. And stay tuned for our, our infographic and thank you template in the coming weeks. I also wanna wish you the best of luck with your Giving Tuesday campaigns over the next few weeks as well. Lastly, our next webinar will not be until January, so we'll see you in 2018. Happy holidays and have a great day. Bye.